Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Bringing Care Home podcast. I'm your host, Kathy McGuire. And with me today is Dr. Marcy Cardi. Marcy is the president and chief medical officer of My Laurel. And My Laurel is an advanced care organization that treats patients at home to avoid the conventional acute care journey. So we're really eager to hear about uh, My Laurel today. And Marcy, you and I got a chance to talk a few weeks ago, um, and I'm really eager to continue that conversation. How about, so welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Excellent. Well, how about if we start um, with you telling our audience, um, they're always eager to hear how these companies get started and, 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 and how their leaders kind of come to be. And so how about if you tell them a little bit about your personal professional journey um, to, to where you are now? I'd love to. Um, so l- let me just go back uh, before medical school. I, I spent about a year and a half working at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and watched patients flow through the hospital and really thought there's got to be a better way. Um, so patients were getting surgery and spending eight, nine, 10 days. And we were, we were really implementing one of the first EMRs. And I got really interested in patient flow and patient quality and thinking about how do we uh, standardize this? And so instead of going to medical school, which had always been my plan, I went into healthcare consulting and did management consulting, um, really focused on inpatient care in the hospital for about five years. Loved that until I worked uh, for a client out on the West Coast doing some population health where we thought we were talking about how do you keep people out of the emergency room? And the doctors there said, we're not going to be able to listen to you because you don't have a MD. And we don't want to change. And I thought, wow, well, if I'm going to change healthcare and really make a difference, I need to go to medical school to uh, allow me to make changes in healthcare systems. And so, so people well, will listen to me. <laughs> yeah. So long story short, I spent, uh, you know, I did a medicine resident, internal medicine residency, primary care, uh, did a palliative care fellowship and came out on the other side and spent about 10 years trying to fix the hospital. Um, so a lot of microsystem work, a lot of change management, a lot of patient quality, safety work. And in the end, uh, the real big game changer for me was population health um, and thinking about how do I keep people out of this place that I've been really trying to improve for 10 years. And, and I really haven't looked back. Um, I think it's a way better place to be treated. People have a voice in the home. And, and so why not try to bring care to them? Uh, so it's as you and I talked about, right? Form follows finance, and if we could just get form to follow function, the world would be a better place, right? Totally correct. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So how did you get to you? You've you've worked on a bunch of startups um, in your career and kind of you know progressed through them. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So. I think the the game changer for me was I was working at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts. We had the opportunity to contract with Landmark Health, um, and we brought Landmark in for our high high utiliz- like high utilizing Medicare Advantage patients. And overnight, I felt like this new model changed what great looked like in Massachusetts. So suddenly, my patients had access to someone who 24-7 would come into the home, who could put IVs into um, some of our patients, and had a phone answered by a human. And and I thought, I've spent so many years trying to change the system. Wouldn't it be nice just to build for purpose, build something outside the system that can radically change um, how care is delivered, how people uh, are cared for, and set it as a new standard for for a community. And so I I left Blue Cross, went to a couple startups, um, Aspire Health, City Block Health, um, was there for about three years. And while at City Block, one of the things that most impressed me was uh, something I had nothing to do with, but it was the mobile integrated care unit where we had paramedics who went into some of our patients' home and and it really allowed us to not have to send some people into the emergency room. And so the use of paramedics and the use of emergency room physicians via telehealth seemed like a really natural um, extension of what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it for people who you know, also were palliative, also were perhaps uh, on hospice and really wanted to avoid that that hospital journey. 
And so I had the opportunity to leave um, City Block and join my Laurel now about two and a half years ago. It was a separate iteration of the company, but um, you know, we've really been building towards that vision. Nate, excellent, excellent. Well, so, you know, there's been just since the pandemic, I mean, you know, it's the new, it used to be, uh, you know, years ago, people said before and after Pearl Harbor, before, after this, before, after that, now it's before, after the pandemic, right? What, um, you know, we've seen a lot of organizations, either health systems trying to do hospital at home or acute care at home. We've seen, you know, so many um, of, you know, competitors start to pop up. What, what are you guys doing at my Laurel that you feel like is going to be the differentiator that, that is, you know, really getting at um, that idea of changing the conventional acute care journey? Yeah. Yeah. Kathy, it's a great question. And it's one that, uh, you know, for all, I would love for lots of people to be doing this, frankly. Right. And, you know, there's a, a lot of patients who can be impacted and no one company is going to be able to take care of all of them. And so, let me just start with what what we do. Um, so we have three different things we partner uh, with anyone holding risk, right? So it can be a health plan, it can be a health system, it can be an ACO. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, so we partner with folks who who take risk. I'll, I'll, um, and anyone really holding risk for a group of patients. Um, and with those patients can do three different types of things. The first is called rapid advanced care. Um, the second is recovery at home. And the third is acute care at home. And so with rapid advanced care, um, we partner with our physicians, with clinical offices, with anyone who's clinical in the home and, and basically are another tool in their tool belt. Um, so if you were thinking, uh, this patient's not sick enough. I can keep them at home and I'll see them in the morning. They're, they're not our patient. Um, but if you're thinking you may send someone to the emergency room, we become an option for those groups. We're not yet doing surgery at home. We're not doing strokes at home or, you know, uh, cardiac, um, acute um, uh, uh, cardiac pain. But really, any other kind of general medical uh, acute symptom, we are now treating, treating at home. Our differentiator is two things. One is we don't go direct to patients. Um, so the patients that we, uh, you know, have the best return on investment for our partners on and where we make the biggest difference um, are patients who are elderly, patients who um, are frail, and patients who are multi-chronic. Um, so, you know, patients who are in and out of the hospital, you know, our PACE patients are a perfect example where our average patient's 83 years old with 13 or more medications. So these are the kind of patients when they show up in the emergency room are often admitted. And so what we're finding is the kind of patients that we're seeing 30, 35% of the time when they show up in the emergency room, they're admitted. And then about 50% of the time they go on to a nursing facility. If you roll that back and you call us, we'll, we'll be in the home within 90 minutes. Um, so often far faster than uh, what, you know, when someone's seen in the emergency room. Um, we, depending on the state, are either the person in the home is either a, a very experienced paramedic that we've cross-trained um, or a nurse practitioner. We have an emergency physician on telehealth, and we can initiate diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, so that about 90% of our patients we keep at home, um, and my team knows if we're keeping 100%, then we're either seeing the wrong patients um, or we're not... Um, you know, escalating as fast as we need to be. Right, right. Well, and, and, it, and it's interesting because um, if you think about the number of frail people with multi-chronic conditions, right? If they average 13 medical conditions and, you know, 12 meds and, um, and are 83 years old, chances are if they went to the hospital in, incorrectly for a hangnail, somebody would find something to admit them for because there's so right. many things going on. So if you don't know their background, you're going to do a whole bunch of things. Exactly. So really, really neat that you're doing this. I, you know, you mentioned pace and um, obviously the, our audience knows that's one of my lifelong passions. But, um, you know, when I think about what a, what a small um, number of pace, pace patients that go to the hospital because they do such a great job keeping them out, if, if you've got a program like this working it to enhance them, then their hospitalizations go down even more. Wow, what a combination. 
It's like, it, it's exactly. And we're working right now with, you know, two of the largest ones in New York and finding, um, you know, it's an incredibly great way to augment what they're doing in each of their um, facilities as well. So if, if they're tapped out in terms of resources, one of their nurses calls out sick, we can also flex up and flex down to meet, meet their demands. Sure. Well, in, the, in New York City, those PACE programs have a lot of contracted docs that are community physicians, too, that aren't based in the centers. So I bet you that's a great augmentation uh, for them. That's right. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. So when you think about, um, you know, the, the, your company kind of came together from two other companies over the last few years and uh, and moving forward, kind of make really making progress. What what would you say is the biggest challenge for not only for my laurel right now, not just because it's a startup, right, but because of the work that you're doing? What are what are the biggest challenges um, that, you know, you, you, you see kind of in the winds ahead of you? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to turn the question around just a bit. Um, so uh, I think for the industry, one of the biggest challenges really is reimbursement. Um, and, and so as, as we think about hospital at home, um, and building a model that requires a lot of intensive upfront investment, um, whether that's in technology, um, or just to meet regulatory oversight, um, that, that, that is, that's one challenge. The second challenge is, is when you care for people in the home, um, there is a lot of drive time. There is a lot of equipment that just re isn't reimbursed in the fee for service, um, you know, like methodology. And so for both of those reasons, hospital at home struggles, you know, and, and we have struggled with just what's the right way to be reimbursed and to um, make sure we're being covered for the value that we're bringing in, in, into any of the organizations we partner with. Sure. Sure. In, in the home health world, we call that windshield time, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's really hard. Well, and you know, you're right because again, Form follows finance and finance pays for what you do as soon as you check in. And then, you know, so, so fixing that and yeah. figuring out what, you know, and whether that's a capitation or a DRG or some other thing, I think that's going to be a big challenge for everyone. Um, and so I, I, I'm sure you've got people working on that right now. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's what we've been trying to move with our payer partners and our ACOs into shared savings and subcap risk as quickly as we can. Um, you, you know, it, it allows, I think, a lot of freedom, therefore, in how we treat, when we treat, um, you know, and what we bring into the home. And so being able to go in twice a day, bring the antibiotics someone might need to be able to, you know, avoid the emergency room. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a huge differentiator for us because we're right now taking seven days of risk. In other words, if someone goes into the emergency room after we see them, um, you know, we don't get paid. And so we really want to align ourselves with value-based organizations and, and know and have people believe that like our care model is um, safe and that we're very much aligned with treating someone safely at home. Excellent. Well, it makes good partners when you both have the, uh, you know, the positive and the, and the downside exactly. um, to share. Exactly. Well, and so tell me, you guys shared with me your guidebook, your kind of your like partnership guidebook. And, and, uh, and I think one of the things about, you know, picking a partner um, is, um, you know, what, what do you each bring to the table? What do they need from you? Um, and, and also, you know, what, what's available there when you, when you all seek partners, um, do you, do you seek partners that can also, um, tend to be able to provide some of the services as well? Um, do you guys say, Hey, we're going to do this for you? How, you know, how, when you, when you're seeking partners, how do you, um, how does a partner know they're the right person to, uh, to work with you guys and they should call you? Yeah. Very good question. Um, so, so a couple of things, if you've got the right type of patient, so, you know, p PACE patients are our prototype, um, duals are our prototype, Medicare Advantage are prototype, um, anyone with uh, dialysis patients, anyone with high risk oncology patients. So uh, anyone who has a high risk of being admitted um, and has a preponderance of those patients is a really good partner. Um, and then I think going back to your first question, which was just about, um, you know, lots of people trying to build this. The reason that, that our model works for us is that we have density. 
right? And so the only way to get to a patient within 90 minutes and be able to again and again and again, put the IV and get, you know, a really nice ultrasound at the bedside um, is for our people to be doing this a lot. And so we've exercised our muscle a lot. And so the right partner um, is really anyone who's decided they're happy to, to buy rather than build it themselves. Mm -hmm. And, gotcha, gotcha. and so we are a very lightweight uh, model to implement, and we do that on purpose. Um, so we have a, a way that we engage your physicians. Um, we have a very lightweight implementation plan. So within 90 days, we will be up and running and taking your patients. Um, and we, we want to make it easy um, because everybody has a ton of different things going on now. And anytime you're deciding to buy, we want to make it easy for you to buy and, and also for us to be able to deliver on, on the results that we've promised. Excellent. Excellent. Well, so when, when you think about, um, you know, obviously there's things that you guys are working on that you can't tell, tell our audience, but um, what, you know, what's next for you guys when you, you know, um, uh, new populations, just, just organic growth because you're really just, you're starting to, you know, hit your stride. What's, what's new, what's next for you guys? Yeah. So I'll talk to two different things. So one is geography. Um, we have, um, as I said, not gone the Peter peanut butter way to make, um, to spread ourselves too thin, but we, we have density right now in the New York, New Jersey region, um, in New Orleans, and we are moving in Q2 into Florida. Um, and so we know that there are a lot of people who could benefit from our services in Florida, and we found a lot of uh, potential partners with ACO. So Florida being the next geography we go to. And then from a kind of product perspective, um, the other place we're moving is to really help with health systems. Um, and so we have our first uh, partnership with a health system, um, you know, should be going live in the next couple of months. And, and that really takes our model. And instead of taking people before they get to the hospital, it's taking people out of the emergency room and out of uh, inpatient, you know, as early as possible. So having them be discharged and then us taking them home, providing that acute care. Um, so whether that's a continuation of IV treatment, continued nebulizers, um, you know, while sensitivities grow out. And it's doing a readmission reduction program, which we've been doing now for about five years, where we know we have a true impact over the 30-day readmission rate. So it kind of combines the reduction in length of stay that hospitals really need because they're being crushed right now with census. And, yep. and the other is reducing those admissions so that those patients are not coming back to the hospital. Yeah, with, with so many hospital closures across the country since the pandemic and the financial straits that they've been in, uh, capacity has become a, a big issue for hospitals where, you know, before the pandemic, hospitals are like, hmm, keep people out of the hospital. What are we going to do for revenue? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so well, what we found is that this also helps people, you know, bring their surgical cases in their centers of excellence and, you know, push some of the patients that, you know, are relatively stable, but need another day or two of watching um, home. And, and we're seeing their HCAP scores go up and, you know, patients love being at home. After they've had two days of hospital food, yeah. <laughs> now they can have their uh, their spouse or their daughter or their neighbor cook for them. Exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. you know, when I think of what, something you just said, you know, when I think about where you, where you started your journey, working in the hospital as an administrator, trying to move throughput, trying to um, you know lower length of stay, trying to get people out and and reduce the frequent flyers, you couldn't push them out. So now you've you've. Uh, it was an expensive journey. Go go to medical school, but you come you come out the other side, and you said, "Hey, I'm going to pull them out." <laughs> so true. I never thought about it like that. Neat, neat. Well, this is great work. Um, and um, so so if uh, if somebody in our audience is from a health system or from a PACE program or some other organization that says, "Wow, you know, we could really we could really uh, think about how we talk to them," um, how would it, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so probably the, the, the best way is to go on our website, um, which is just um, www.mylaurelhealth.com, um, you know, or I, I assume that my name, if anyone, if anyone yeah. wants to Google me or I'm M. Cardi at mylaurelhealth.com, I'm happy to, happy to speak to anyone. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I hope that, you know, you and I are kindred spirits in so many ways with our pace, uh, our love of pace, geriatrics and palliative care. 
Um, I will uh, look forward to catching you at a conference or, or talking to you again. I'm eager to hear about the progress that you make and, uh, and perhaps we'll have you back on the show again uh, to talk about uh, the successes that you're uh, creating every day. That's great. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you for uh, pushing pace because I can't wait to be in a pace when I'm older. <laughs> it's the best way to be cared for. Yeah. That's that's right. Well, you know, you won't get an argument from me. Um, well, so thank you very much. Um, Happy New Year to all of our listeners. And uh, thank you to Dr. Marcy Cardi, the president and chief medical officer of My Laurel. Mm-hmm.